Okay, and we're back. Okay, so um, I think, I don't know if we're done with, with this topic. Uh, does anyone else have any other questions about version two? And then they want to hammer down any examples we want to try to work through. Thanks again, uh, Dimitri. Great job giving us an overview of some of the big stuff and your your you know tool here for converting. It's a start, great start in the right direction. Yeah, I'm still working on it, and it actually starts working quite well. But the more code I can test, uh, the more drugs that I can find and fix. Uh, and I'll also probably need a lot of uh, uh, tests. Uh, couples verify if some somebody changes it that it doesn't break the, the code, of course. Geek to uh, saying I cited for namespaces in version two because it reduces the risk of name conflicts when writing libraries if used appropriately. Um, I I totally do get some of these uh, things that, that Geek to is saying because when uh, a program becomes complex enough, or uh, here he's talking about libraries or package management and stuff like that, absolutely you begin having either so much code or you have it separated up in ways where it becomes harder for you to actually keep track if you ain't absolutely consistent with your naming conventions and stuff like that. Where absolutely stuff like these namespaces will be a nice addition, but again, it's it's pretty advanced stuff. So you will probably see, as you did with version one one, people converting over with the most advanced people doing it first. Yeah, I think Gabe had asked a question, which is ironic that I, I just I didn't, I didn't ignore it, but I saw it. Um, it had something to do with uh, having libraries and, and things to be able to share, right? And um, like Python does. And um, it, it's one of the things I hated about Python, though, was, oh my God, I had to keep downloading all these different versions of Python and, and shove them into different libraries. And I got really confused, even though I understood how, because of all the different other functions that were available and I'd have them in certain environments, but man, that was confusing as all get out. I, I like auto hockey has, you know, a fair amount of built-in functionality. Um, and then I go, but now I do remember actually, you know, Oh, that's right. But this is the other one, big one, uh, which, um, love it or hate it. Isaiah, when it was kind of funny, we were on a, we were on a, him and I were on a call and I mentioned something about, yeah, I don't use the include command. I just put it in my library. And he's like, you have to use the include command. I'm like, no, not if it's in one of these three places. And he's like, no, you still have to use the include. And I showed him and he's like, that's, he's like, that's crazy. And then um, he read up on it. He's like, you, you're right. But he's like, that is so crazy. And I said, I understand why you're saying it because there's no way if you look at a program, you know, straight on its own, there's no include. So how would you know you're leveraging something in your library, right? So it's quote unquote dangerous in that sense. Um, however, I love it because I use my library like crazy and I put my functions on my library and I don't have to use an include. And I love that, but that's going away in version two, if I remember correctly. I haven't tried it. Uh, that's interesting. Yeah, it's what was that? I actually haven't read that, but uh, yeah, you right. right. must use the include command. To, it won't automatically search in default locations. Oh, okay. Yeah, which again, it's it's not a big deal to me. Um, it's it. I agree. It, it's better form, better um, code ethics, uh, ethics um, thing that you should be doing. But yeah. But, okay, so Geek Dude is right now in the chat writing. I almost exclusively write code for other people. So includes are necessary for me. And then he adds, but for debugging functions, I don't include them. Uh, I'm not entirely sure I fully understand what you're saying, but I understand that you need to include functionality from other places. 
but for your own debugging functions, those that you use to debug the things that you're writing for other people, you don't include those? Is Does that, okay, exactly, he says, so fair enough. Yeah, so I understood it quite well. Yeah, I understand why you would do it this way around, because sure, if you have stuff that you're just using for your day-to-day -day writing of code for others, for libraries, for packages, um, you can have Joe as you do in your um, library folder functions that make sense for your debunking functionality. For the M function that you have from uh, Maestrith that makes the message box, stuff like that. But yeah, if you're then sharing it um, haphazardly at, on the forum or whatever, you might have references to code that is not there. And people will be sitting there and seeing an M function. What does that do? My, yeah. my script is giving me an error, right. missing function. Um, and but. they don't see it referenced from anywhere. And there's no include line. So they have no idea of what um, library to go and look for. So yeah, right. I do understand the dangers of the lib folders. Yeah, ex except for Studio goes and finds those and packs them up for you. When, yeah, if you publish the code, right? Right. So yeah. so anyway, so, so that's why to me I'm like whatever. I don't you know I do have to remember to use publish, but when I'm sharing stuff, usually I'm I'm better at that. Um, but but and I'm opposite of geek dude. Rarely do I share stuff with other people. Almost everything I do is for me. I'm greedy, you know. And I know you guys are laughing because I'm like you see stuff on my website, right? But the most stuff I, I write, you know, a couple of day scripts for doing stuff. Um, it's the exceptions for me that I actually post somewhere. Um, but normally I try to use the publish command. What I don't like about it is it'll go pull everything from that library. So like if I reference my Excel library for one little function, it'll pull the entire Excel function library in. But really, I just wanted a couple, you know, one or two of the pieces of it. Um, I'm not complaining, though. Right? Yeah, anything. I I saw that the uh, quick dude, he mentioned that the uh, CQT, quick code tester, um, also is able to fetch um, functions from, from there. Geek dude, can you say if does it only fetch the needed function or the entire uh, file that the function is in? Maybe he's not listening, but fair enough. He probably has other things to do. It pulls the whole file. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Uh, I actually have a question. Does somebody knows a little bit about the Visual Studio Code? Visual Studio Code, I, I know only a little. I, I, I do use it as my standard editor right now, but I'm not currently writing a lot of code. So what? Because uh, I wanted to, yeah, I, I'm still a bit struggling with, um, with uh, GitHub, and I wanted to know how I, how I can upload, for example, this code of the, the converter. Uh, Did you watch our uh, I say yes for that. Yeah. Did you did you watch the webinar though that we did on it? Is it? Yeah, well, I think I'll need to rewatch it again. And then we did a separate video as well, you know, on it, um, if I remember correctly. So anyway, yeah, it, it was a really good to me intro. I don't use it. I, I have it, but I don't program in it. I'd also say. Um... I say as uses the command line and a few other tools for GitHub uh, way better than I do. I use a few extensions for um, VS Code uh, that helps me keep track of the stuff uh, I upload to GitHub. Um, fairly simple, everything working in the VS Code setup, so I'm not switching over to any other means. And um, I don't currently know it well enough to teach it to you, Dimitri. Yeah, yeah, I followed uh, the uh, uh, videos and I also try to install the extensions. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, I'm sometimes also I'm a little unsure uh, 
how I need to do it correctly. Yeah, I, I'd say you could probably manually just go to GitHub and upload the script and then connect to it via VS Code and then let the extensions keep uh, the two synced. Um, yeah. But yeah, depending on whatever things you're trying to learn. Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll figure it out. Uh, I'm liking a bit of, little bit of time at the moment. Yeah, I fully understand that. Did anybody have anything else they want to talk about? Anything they had they were stuck on, want to work on, or or show off? A question about using arrow keys for. Um, hotkeys and I sort of hate to bring it up because I feel like I'm bringing I'm dumbing the conversation way down don't worry about it it's been so yeah. far but uh I'd like to you know how you can hold the control key and use your left right arrows to select entire words at a time instead of uh or move jump entire words at a time instead of just a single character at a time in an editor you can hold shift control to select entire words at a time. Um, I'd like a way to jump more characters. And so I've got a, uh, if I do a right control and left key and then just send a left arrow like 30 times. And if I hold my control and hit left, then it jumps 30 characters. But I've lost my, I've now lost my ability to jump a word at a time because that right control is overriding the native you know, control. So I thought about if I used left control and right control with an arrow to, to say only in that scenario, do I want to do my jump? And if I just use the single control, then it wouldn't trigger the hotkey and I would still be able to jump one word at a time. Uh, but my L control ampersand R control ampersand left is seen as a syntax error, whereas R control ampersand left is not. I was, uh, I was, I wasn't, I was having a bit of a hard time following everything you said, but I think I did get it in the end. Um, couldn't you use? Um, I'm not sure if you want to keep the functionality of selecting words with. What shift control? Uh, shift how control you, and arrow you, do that? Let you select words. Yeah. Couldn't you then have it in steps? So instead of it being one entire hotkey that did it for you, you had like a key wait after pushing control, stuff like that. Um, so it was saying, additional. Sort of a timing thing where if you did it quick, it would jump a word, and if you held it longer, held the control key longer, and then hit the arrow, it would jump further. Yeah. Um, I think that's a great idea. I don't know how to use the key weight like that, though, but uh, mm -hmm. I can go do some research. There's a post that I, I have, I can find it, but just showing how to do a long press hotkey, which I think you could should be easily okay, adapt. Well, that's not a good I mean, the other thing I would do is just consider having, you know, like, I, I I don't know how I would I I guess if both hands are on your keyboard then using both control keys would work. Personally, I would do like control shift, you know, for the long and then your arrow key to do the the longer one and then just control arrow for the shorter one or something like that. But I think Jackie's point too is a good suggestion. Well, the thing is control shift lets you select words at a time instead yeah, well, of pick, move pick words a different at a time. Option. And I use that feature quite frequently yeah. still pick a, just pick a different hotkey right it's, yeah I, I would just stick with the same hand is my point if you can right yeah no i i, I follow you I, I do see your point um so i'll google long pre auto hotkey long press <laughs> um geek dude also tried uh, or posted an example of how he'd put in um left right control left in the chat, if you wanted to see it, if it resembles how you did it. 
<laughs> well, I got to decipher that. Left control, right control. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I see what you're saying. Uh, that might work. I don't know. Uh, although Joe is probably right about the uh, using the same hand. The alt key, somebody, uh, Geek Dude said there's also alt. I actually already use alt left. You know how when you get a, uh, a spelling mistake and you get the red squiggle under it? Uh, right when you hit space, if I hit alt left arrow, I made a hot key that skips me back a couple of spaces, then hits the right uh, mouse button, the, the, the key that, is, that represents the right mouse click. And then it hits the home, which takes you to the top of the misspelled words list, which is usually the right one. And then I can hit enter to fix that spelling error. Um, so anyway that that one i use all the time that just alt left arrow it's just right there easy to get to and it just fixes alt left arrow enter will fix a misspelling mistake without me having to monkey with the mouse reach for the mouse mm -hmm. nice so i'm putting both one was one that we did just recently it was detecting multiple presses not that i recommend that one i'm just it did come to mind it came up in my search so i said what the hell uh, but the second one i posted was the long press it was an example we gave as a script highlight okay well thank you very much but yeah kudos to you for you know again it's it's little things like that that i find you know where suddenly i go oh my god auto hockey is amazing you know, yeah. I realize I'm doing this thing over and over. I'm like, why? Why isn't this a thing? Why didn't I do something for this? Okay. Everybody, else? Anybody else have something? I did, uh, you know what, let me, so that they don't, let me, let me share my screen here. Uh, the video, it's, I think it's scheduled to be released Thursday just because I, you know, I've been scheduling them, but um, I found this site, it was pretty interesting. Um, is this the webhook site? Am I sharing? Yeah. I don't know why my, I don't have it highlighted. It's not showing me that what I'm sharing, but what, what I thought was really cool. So those of you who've been at some of these webinars, right, I've, I've been really working with APIs a lot. And what was cool is you can have a web hook and basically it's an endpoint you can go to and then trigger like if i actually if i open this new browser actually let me let me copy this link and i'm gonna um oh come on so i'm gonna trigger it here and we'll see so that was the api call that was done to that site and we can see it so what i thought was really cool about this was like with fiddler I can look on my computer about what auto hockey or a browser sent. This is kind of showing me the server side of things. Hey, I got that API call. What did I, you know, get and return? Um, I thought it was a cool way to help understand what's really happening with a, a web service API call. Um, at some point, I would love someone to give me some help um, and talk through about setting up web hooks and how to catch them and trigger stuff off of them I, mean, I understand the concepts but um just finding one where i can because there's yeah things like zapier and things you know you can pay a lot of money for but i don't want to pay money right so i want to be able to have a server that's always online send things to it uh http request to it to trigger things i um, mean maybe have that trigger sending a um a text right or an email or something like that geek dude seems to be willing to help you later joe Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Because uh, I know he's got so much free time. I'm, I'm too busy. <laughs> but that would be, I think it's a great topic. Oh, which is also, and, and Jackie, you know, and I, I think that one's out maybe next week or the week after, I forget, uh, the podcast we did talking about Windows 365. Oh, yeah. yeah. It is really an interesting thing of as much as a lot of things, the negatives I have with Windows 365, at the same time, if I can now have my auto hockey stuff, hopefully running in a cloud, always available. Um, maybe I don't have to worry, you know, I, I can now do stuff that I couldn't normally do. It's always running, right? It's, it's a great thing. Yeah. 
And Rava, he just mentioned in the chat that uh, Geek Dude's um, example of how he might be able to solve the left-right control plus left seems to have actually solved his syntax error. So that's great. Yeah, honestly, to me, some of that stuff, like in the, uh, I think it was the long, no, there was one, I think it was the auto boulder. Um, if you guys saw the, the the thumbnail on the video, it was a car, a boulder sitting on top of a car. So, but it was auto bolding was you go to highlight, you go to click something and it automatically you like double clicked it and bolded it. Uh, and when Isaiah was doing that in that automating, like selecting of what it's doing, you would think that's a simple thing. And yet, boy, it's, it's much more complicated to me uh, and the timing of it uh, than, than what I would have expected. Joe, I, I have uh, maybe a question that's not really uh, out of hotkey related, but um, I saw that in your uh, emails, you sometimes uh, add an uh, ECS file to yeah. automatically uh, give us the opportunity to add something to the uh, calendar. ICS file, yes. Yeah. yes, yes, yes. How, how do we make those? It, it's um i manually did one and uh it's just a text file right that i i looked into a long time ago and i was programmatically doing all this crazy stuff and then i finally said oh my god you know what just screw it um i'm gonna make one that it's and because it's a recurring uh, meeting i took care of it that way but they are just plain text files and and you can read documentation um if you google it they'll talk about how to set up the to the from the dates all the stuff right um it's it's sort of straightforward um there were some i forget there was some weirdness and that's what drove me nuts and especially dealing with the time zones and when the time zone the the, the you know um what do we call it the um when our stuff would change uh go out daylight savings Summer time. time yeah yeah it was and then some calendars you needed to set both the two the the beginning and the end the other ones you could say starts here and goes two hours and so I used to do like the Google because you could do it for the Google calendar as well as for the ICS for the you know, Outlook stuff. But um, what I really did in that specific example was I did one in Zoom. I exported it and then I just studied the Zoom example and broke it down, you know, but it is just plain text and you can just look at it and go, oh, okay. It's actually Gabe will laugh at this because he could tell you this. We did this what was it, Gabe, probably like 15 years ago, in SPSS, which is the statistical programming language that we used to code in, I built an ICS file in SPSS, and it was hilarious because the, the statistical program was creating a calendar invite, and he's like, what, what are you doing? I'm like, it's just plain text. You just have to save it with that, as uh, Geek Dude, I think, was mentioning earlier with the different extensions, right, and then things treat them differently, but yeah, it was, uh, it, it's, it's not rocket science, but there were parts that were pretty confusing. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I prefer to uh, create something that would make it for me because I'm actually a diver. And sometimes we invite people to go diving, to dive spots. And then it would be cool to also send a file like that. So so everybody has directly the, the correct time and place uh, in their calendars. Yeah, so uh, Geek Dude, he just mentioned that most calendar apps he believes actually lets you save your uh, event uh, as an ICS okay. event. So, so if you use Outlook or Gmail or whatever, you might have an option somewhere to actually save the events. Oh, interesting. Worth looking into before you start diving into documentation and stuff. It's funny. I see. I read his comment, uh, Jackie, as meaning his because he programs so much, right? He creates crazy. Stuff. I thought he meant his calendar, like something he had written. <laughs> um, and now I understand. Uh, I can see how it's. He's just saying, yeah, you're, you're right. They, they do. Um, and by the way, Mesh just wrote back to me and said, right now he's not personally planning to add the language pack to, to version two. 
but someone can create one and you know include it but right now he wasn't planning you know hasn't worked on it or planned on it okay next clouds calendar app does anyone know of a auto hotkey script that works like the uh the time clock the world time clock where i could pick different countries and have it tell me what time it is right there right then um i figured someone had to have written one right it it would be very helpful when because like if i had people like when i worked at ti i had people in different you know and even now with jackie and and with um dimitri in Bel belgium so we said dimitri i have a terrible memory but um it'd be nice to be able to kind of pre-program things to have them bookmarked and then have it automatically show me those times which it's very simple stuff right it's just having a gui to make it simple to, to select the country and then have it convert your time for you yeah i i'm not sure someone has made something exactly like that because even though auto hotkey does have some functionality around it um it's 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 a hassle to program because you actually need to understand all the different rules from all the different time zones because we don't have daylight savings time at the same time and <laughs> some are plus one, some are only half an hour. I'm, I like I didn't really understand until a few years ago that not everybody was on a different hour, but that people are even on half hour intervals is like, what? but yeah. Yeah, and, and some states and some cities in the U.S. don't change. Yeah, it's it's ludicrous. How, and then there's just the whole general concept, right, of the whole shifting of everything to shift it to the Greenwich Mean Time and then shift it back to something else. I'd say it's it's one of those that's still kind of weird for us to have. I, uh, we're in a place where everybody is pretty um, synced up. We use GPSs and we do all kinds of other stuff and we kind of acknowledge that space is quite a lot bigger than us and we use a specific amount of time to circle the earth and circle the sun and stuff like that but you know what yeah it's not 12 o'clock right now because it's summer so it's actually 11 o'clock right? is it, what it's <laughs> yeah. how how does that really compute but yeah um, it's an old way of doing stuff Jackie, I do not think that any country will accept that their time zone will not be the main time zone. Yeah. So. That's awesome. Um, incidentally, and that was what I also recently released, was uh, uh, an API just using the Google Translate, which that was a simpler one. But um, I'm, I'm helping this local Mexican restaurant, and they're they barely speak English. And when I say barely, I mean like it's it's barely. So I've been automating texting, translating using Google Translate to translate into Spanish for me. Um, and it's been a really great time saver. And I'm like, you know, I need to do a little more with it to to incorporate, let's see, I could do it with push bullet. Yeah, I could do it with push bullet because push bullet has an API, right? And so I could programmatically, when it's from Carlos, automatically convert what he wrote for me. And if I'm typing to Carlos, I type in English and hit send and have it translate it, you know, and, and send it. That would be pretty awesome. Okay, well, if anyone doesn't have anything else, I get to go to my other job back at the Mexican restaurant and bus tables, uh, which you, you might think I'm joking, but I'm not, um, but I'm just helping them out. So thank you all for being here. Um, Dimitri, again, thank you so much for putting yeah. your time into this and effort. Um, Thanks for jumping in there, and it's uh, it's very interesting. I'm looking forward to seeing a updated version of your converter, but um, it's it's cool. You got to start on it. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye.